And the discipline is, is to go ahead and give people a picture. This is my mission. That's what I do. Very short, but get into the need. Nothing about you to some degree. It, it is, what is God showing me, of course? But it's really about the need. Because donors just cannot connect to stories that are kind of all back and forth about this is what I'm doing. And, and so um, almost every first edition of the working paper doesn't keep it clear. And we have found the fundraising task has increased greatly in every culture when we stay to the format of first starting off of trying to help the donor see what you see about the need. And so... Um, and I could, if Dang was here, I'd kind of walk through it and you would see kind of what happened there. Um, and so the first section is just to really try to think in as short as possible to say, what is the need that I'm addressing? It's not necessarily the need of the whole country, but it's the need that specifically God has shown you. And then you jump to what is God telling me to do about it? But it doesn't have to be track record. Uh, because a lot of times we jump into it and start talking about, this is what I've done, this is what I've done. At the early stage of addressing a donor, whether it's a local donor or it's a, um, they really need to get into the story of what's around you. And the story is, here is the need and here's the opportunity. The opportunity is there as well. Here's what God is calling me to do about it. And here's what would happen if I did. Um, and we really do, and so just, uh, you know, I'll quit screen share. So, um, stop that. Get up again. So, um, so for example, um, what we don't wanna do is, is, and this is Dang, and Dang's got wonderful paragraphs in here. Um, and it's really well, well stated. This is great. It gets started. Um, but what happens is now we start talking about ourselves. That's not what we want to talk about. We want to talk about the need that is out there. And so what happens is it gets into all about justifying kind of what I do and how I do it. And, um, and the problem is that's not the logic that somebody listens through when they're new in the process of engaging you. And so, um, so I guess as we think about the working paper, normally what I do in this is we just look at working papers and I just walk through and we start coaching and, and we'll do something else today. But as you think about your working paper, please stay to the format of what is God showing me? What is the need and the opportunity? What is God telling me to do about it? What would happen if I did it? Then we can get in, later we'll get into track records and and the ideology and the unique approach you're using, all that will come later, but you won't engage the donor unless you have that. So let me stop at that point. That has kind of been what people have said has been that understanding has said for a lot of folks have said that has made my fundraising so much more effective, just getting into the discipline of need, vision, outcomes. What is God telling, showing me? What is God telling me to do? What is God, uh, what would it look like if I did it? So let me stop at that point. Do, do, do you understand why when somebody doesn't know about you and about your situation and you are stewarding that opportunity to help connect why those are in such important disciplines to stay there? And once you write it, you'll do that verbally. You know, we call it the, the it's a, it doesn't really, it's a not true, but an elevator speech. When you find yourself in an in elevator with a donor and you're going to the fifth floor and they ask you, what do you do? you would still stay to, this is what God is showing me. This is what is God telling me to do about it. These are the outcomes. It's short in a conversation. It'll be on your website. It'll be in letters of inquiry. It's just a kind of a way of thinking. It'll be in conversations and cab rides of really being clear on what is God showing me? What is God telling me to do? What is what it would happen if I did it? So let me stop at that point. That logic has been really something we have found and uh, has been very helpful to kind of change the way the effectiveness of connecting with especially new donors. Does that make, is that any questions about why we use those three questions and why that's important not to get into track record, not to get into story, not to get into ideology, unique methods, unique curriculum, all of that early in the conversation. Yes, it makes sense. Um, 
Yeah, because at the end, people just want to know what is what you do uh, or your organization does. Uh, what are you trying to change and how you, you're addressing, uh, you're approaching that effort of change. Um, so mission statement is not necessarily an answer to what we do. Not really. And so because it doesn't have the emotional appeal. Great question. So at the beginning, if you think about what is a mission statement, it, it, it's usually a purpose statement. We exist in order to do this. And it's usually well worded. It, help, it puts a filing cabinet around a donor. So they mm -hmm. go, oh, now I have a, a filing folder. I mean, it's a file folder. And so he doesn't know you or she doesn't know you or she kind of has heard about it. So when you state your purpose, we exist to do this, all you're doing is creating a filing folder in their head. And if you think about when somebody talks to you and they're kind of, you don't really know what they're talking about, your brain doesn't have an ability to file it someplace. So mm -hmm. when you say your purpose statement, we exist to do this, it immediately creates a filing cabinet or filing folder that they go, oh, they're about education. Oh, they're about city transformation. Don't know what that is yet, but that's what they're about. And then most mission statements have a purpose statement. We exist to do this. We will do that by this, this, and this, which is called a primary means. We'll do this through education. We'll do this through um, hunger alleviation. We'll do this in this way. Now they have another, another way of understanding in their filing folder what you do. Then you say, because that's helpful at the beginning, that purpose statement or the, the mission statement is helpful and it needs to be clear. But after that, then you say, in my area, this is what's happening. There's a need, here's an opportunity. So you gave them the filing folder for a new person to kind of go, oh, this is what we're talking about. Now you're engaging their heart. You're pulling their face alongside of your face and looking with your heart, with your eyes at the need and the opportunity. And then as their face is right beside you, you're saying, but here's a vision for what this could be. God is telling me to do this. And then all of a sudden their face is right there the outcome, if we did it, is this would change, this would change, we would see this and this. What you just did with that is you gave them a filing folder with your, your mission statement, then pulled their face alongside your face, and they look through your eyes at need, opportunity, uh, and vision, and very specifically, concrete outcomes of what would change. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, so Mario, when you have your purpose statement or your mission statement, what is your mission statement? My mission statement is to help grassroots leaders and organizations to love and serve their community and seek its shalom. If you had to add a primary, because that's a purpose statement. Yeah. Mission statements often have primary means as well. You don't have mm -hmm. to have it, but that's kind of what a mission statement is. If you had to say, and that gave me, what that did is you gave me a filing folder. If yeah. you're going to add a little bit to that filing folder with primary means, um, what would you add to it? Well, um, what we uh, the way we do this um, is that we identify um, leaders serving their communities and give them the opportunity to access to training. Um, well, actually the we have access to relationship training and resources so they can implement services to that will bring transformation to their communities so let's back it up so state your purpose statement and then state your primary means again mm -hmm. so our mission or our purpose is to equip and mobilize grassroots leaders to love and serve their communities. We do this by uh, giving them access to relationships, training, and resources to implement services that will bring change to their communities. See, that's perfect. Well said. And so what that does, but if you notice, let's say I'm a new donor, potential donor, I go, oh, well said. I have a great file cabinet, but you haven't got my heart yet. Okay. No, mm -hmm. well, boy, you sure started well because you said it's so clear. There's trust. Um, trust is developed with that degree of clarity. 
somebody that doesn't know anything is going, they were so clear. Now I have a great filing folder. Okay. But they're not going to understand. So for example, if you went off into incarnational leadership, okay, I've watched, you know, and I know that's, people don't even know what you meant by that. Okay. Because mm -hmm. it's a phrase, it's very clear, clear in your community that, that people don't even know. And so a lot of times I've watched people in, in your network try to raise money on incarnational leadership, but it's really a unique thing. Yes, it's so important to you, but they're not ready for it yet. They just don't understand yeah. it. So, mm -hmm. but if you do start off and you say, and then the next kind of in the white, white in the working paper, you would start off with the need and the opportunity. Um, we serve and this is, it depends on kind of how broad you're going. If you're going mm -hmm. for the urban training collaborative worldwide, it's a different thing. But yeah. you're really talking about what you're doing in, 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 in your setting. Um, and then I'm making a Republican. So if you're thinking about that, what would be the most heartfelt way to express the need? And you will get to opportunity because opportunity is mm -hmm. important. But if you had to put together two or three sentences that would really capture somebody's heart, what would you say about the need that you're facing in your, your work? Yeah. Well, the way I try, I, I talk about the, the need usually. Um, I go by saying, well, the Dominican Republic, it's, it's a beautiful country and it has the most growing economy in the last 30 to 50 years in the Caribbean, in the Central American and Caribbean region. But the problem is, the Dominican Republic is also known as, as one of the most um, uh, of the country with the highest inequality. That means the majority of the population still is very poor and communities lack of the basic, uh, you know, let me say it again. That's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll be yeah. writing this down in a working paper. So yeah, yeah. yeah. But the but idea is what you just did is you mm -hmm. started with the opportunity. So people, yes. again, you said this last time, people aren't looking down. They're looking at, wow, this is a fantastic nation and people and culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's the problem. Yeah. There is another sign. And sometimes I, I, if I say it longer, I would say a lot of people are attracted to the DR because of its natural beauty white sandy beaches, uh, a warm uh, culture, hospitality. So you will fall in love with the DR. But the other side of the coin is that the Dominican Republic is still a country affected by extreme poverty for the majority of the population. Uh, a lot of communities are affected by, uh, um, because of this, a lot of communities, <clears throat> lack of the infrastructure and people, especially, young people have lack of access to good quality education, um, appropriate housing, um, health services, and other issues that affects their quality of life. Mm -hmm. And there are many leaders and organizations trying to make a difference in those contexts. The problem is that in most cases, the leaders responding, lack of the knowledge or the training, the resources and the connections to bring about lasting and sustainable change. <clears throat> so our organization, instead of doing more of that, what we do is that we partner with these grassroots leaders and organization, offering them the opportunities to experience transforming transformation themselves as leaders and the organizations and programs that they lead. We offer them training, um, um, we um, access to resources and the connections for uh, collaborative action. And so you, what you're saying is, but there's this, the poverty. And mm -hmm. what we find is, you know, you're, you're, in your course, you're not going to go into appreciative inquiry and asset-based community development. Nope. But what you're saying is, yet there are amazing assets of leadership, commitment, and passion in these poverty areas. So yes. rather than coming in with an outside idea, we come in and help them develop their idea to give them training and they start building solutions from within. Um, exactly. You just said asset-based community development, but you didn't do it, you know, yes. so, but that's what you do. So what mm -hmm. you're trying to do is get into that story of saying we uniquely, that God is showing us this opportunity, but God is telling us 
to come in and really empower what he's already placed there. Yeah. And we do right alongside of him. We don't do it from the outside. And we build up what God has already put there through training, resourcing, helping that. Um, we don't impose something from the outside and we don't create false dependency on the outside. We empower what God has already placed there, which, you know, we've just said incarnational leadership to some degree, AI, asset, A, B, C, D. Yeah. Say it in the story of what God has told you. And you said, if this happens, and mm -hmm. we have seen this, this changes, this changes, this changes, and this changes. Now, you're not getting into the stories of what your success stories yet, but you're saying, if this, the outcomes are, and they have, we've already seen them, I'll tell you more stories about that, is mm -hmm. these things change, and all of a sudden, there's empowerment and ongoing pride, connection, effectiveness, emerging from the community itself. Yes, and that captures their, you know, and I know you, you live in this. So part of it is all of us live in the trees of our work. We're mm -hmm. trying to come out into the forest, look down on the forest, and then start bringing a potential donor in using this, this format. And we found the format is really successful if we stay to it. So, yeah. I'm, I'm going to jump to Ashish, okay? Ashish, if you could do the same, and if you don't mind doing about the youth, um, the, the youth project, because uh, I know you're working on a lot of projects, but the youth project, and you could focus it just on India, or you could focus it on AEA, however you want to do it. So um, if you had to state the mission of your the, the youth project that you're working on, what would be the purpose and the primary means? So go ahead and turn on your mic, Ashish. Yeah. Um, oh. Uh, I may not be able to word it properly right That's now. Okay. But we're we're goofing just... around because you're going to put it in a working paper. Yeah. But it allows <laughs> us to kind of hear each other do that and to practice. Yeah. So the purpose is to uh, train and equip the youth ministry leaders across uh, India. Um, and the need is like, you know, because um, uh, we have made a survey and find, found out that in India, there is no youth ministry training. So uh, I'm back you up just a little bit to stay on track here. So, oh, purpose, sorry. so the purpose is to train youth ministry leaders in India. Okay. Yeah. We will do that by our primary means. We will do that by, we're getting a file folder right now. What are the three primary means you would use to do that? Okay. So the first uh, first thing is to establish a youth ministry leadership training institute, uh, and under that, um, uh, then we will be having different initiatives. So we will be having a formal education system in place and informal education in place, and then we will have kind of a resource development team, uh, department where we will be developing indigenous resources, uh, either from Indian perspective or from Asian perspective. So this is how we will be executing it. So the primary th is to, thing is to establish a center. Uh, and under that, uh, we will have a various initiatives. So that went into structure a little too fast, okay? So the purpose is to create um, youth, uh, the purpose is to create effective youth ministers to minister to you, let's say. We yeah. do this by training. We do this by resourcing um, that are contextualized, come from India. And we do this by ongoing community and connection, okay? Yeah. What that did is created a file folder. Notice you didn't go into a lot of detail. And then the next statement is, did you know that the youngest country in the world is India? Okay, this many people, what's the percentage of people? What's the number of people in India that are 18 years or younger? More than 65%. Okay, and so you are a country of how many billion? You're about a billion, <laughs> is that right? Yeah, I'm unable to recollect that, yeah. So that's that's a quick pop, pop, pop. Um, I think you are, uh, I think you're a billion, aren't you? One, aren't you 1.2, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is... Uh, so how many, what's the population of India? We'll just do that real quick. Okay. Um, population of 2002, uh, it says it's 1.4 billion, okay? 
Okay. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm a theologian, not a mathematician, but 65% of that would be, you said 65, so we know 700,000, 700 million, uh, let's say 800 million. So you would say there are 800 million youth in India, okay? One of the largest, it's the largest, uh, more than China, because China doesn't have your age dispersal. So the largest, um, in the world, 800 million people under 18, and there is no, at this point, no um, uh, 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 nationwide um, training network for youth ministers from churches, okay? That's a problem, okay, and an opportunity. So if I'm a donor and I hear that, and, th and at this point, you're actually using numbers, sometimes using statistics, especially when they're in your favor, I might go, no way, you're kidding me. There's 800 million, first of all, that's a shock, 800 million people in India that are under 18. Um, and of course, we know that a lot of them are Hindu, a lot of them are not ways, not cannot be connected directly through churches at this point. And you say, at this point, we're in the United States, if you're talking to a United States donor, you have effective youth ministers and training and professional youth people. We don't have any of that in India. Um, there is a huge opportunity and a huge need. So let me back up. I know I've probably overstated a few things here. Does that sound true, sort of? Yeah. So those of you that are elsewhere, when you hear that, that way of stating the need and the opportunity, what do you do with that? How does that, how do you respond? So if he's approaching you, Bright, for money, what would you do with that? You're talking to me, Doug. So if Ashish approached you, you were a donor, okay? Uh -huh. donor, mm -hmm. And he approached you and you, he said, here's mm -hmm. the opportunity and the need. Mm -hmm. India, is one of the, by population, um, is one of the youngest nations in the world by the nature of how its population is distributed. We mm -hmm. have 1.4 billion people, 65% are under 18. That means there's 800 million people under 18 in India. And in all of India, there is no um, effective training for youth ministers to uh, reach this age group. What would be your statement as a potential donor? Yeah, so uh, with this one, I will, uh, my thinking will come very quickly to the fact that the youth are uh, people who are ready to be able to do something for themselves. That is the first thing I will be looking at because they, they have enough energy and they have needs to satisfy and they also want to have their names imprinted on the history of the country. So my first looking at the thing will be what there must be a capacity building for this youth so i'll be looking at for training for for example or be looking out for whatever they have already gotten as a, a piece of training and how to harness the skill set for any productive activity yeah. so i'll be looking for anybody coming to me to give me a clear statement as to what he need and what he's ready to do with these people sure the thing about what, what Ashish has that probably none of us have exactly is approaching a foundation with that statement, okay, mm -hmm. 800 million youth, okay, youngest by, by in, the, in the world in terms of uh, distributing a population toward youth, and there's no youth ministry, for a foundation, that's a shock, okay, or for a major donor, that's a shock, and yeah. all of a sudden, you've got their attention using those kind of numbers. Now, not every one of us can do that kind of thing, right? Now, we, we will do it in different ways. The way mm -hmm. Mario does it is articulates this opportunity, this need, and a kind of a unique thing that he comes alongside. And so I'm a potential donor. I'm going, wow, okay. Most people say they have a program and they drop it into the neighborhood. You, mm -hmm. You're building the neighborhood. That's interesting. I want to hear more. With Ashish, He's got this huge set of numbers, okay, that he can use. Uh, and then you've got the, the attention, okay? And at that point, what you've got with the attention of the donors, they're going, whoa, this is gigantic. This is really a problem. Tell me more. And what's happening in their head, they may not have your background, Bright, 
of understanding how youth are particularly a very strategic age to reach for the gospel and for event. Mm -hmm. But they heard something huge, okay? So now that you've got their attention with those numbers, Ashish, what's the next thing you're going to say? Because you're talking about what's the need, uh, what's the vision, and what's the, um, the outcomes? What is God tell, showing me? What is God telling me to do about it? What will happen if I do it? So at this point, you've stated the need and opportunity well. Tell me now, what is God telling you to do about it? Create a center. In that center, you'll work through local churches. In those local churches, you will help them see the value of having a youth minister paid for by the local church. And when they do that, you will create ongoing support and community so there's a whole culture of effective youth ministers throughout the, the, the nation. As those youth ministers are effective, they will not only help um, the youth um, that are Christians to be healthy as Christians, but the youth are going to be the people that are going to reach out in evangelism for those that are, that are not. Um, and, you know, and so you, you really, it's a very effective strategy because you are really hitting the core, strategic, most important thing you can do is empower the local church to value the position of youth ministry and then to hire somebody they pay for it and you are put making them effective um, you really have a strategic lever if that happens it all of a sudden you're releasing millions and millions of young people talking to their friends about Christ and um, and building healthy lives themselves and um, and a little and you can even throw a story in there I have a friend that works as a, at a call center in, um, in Bangalore. And he said, Brad, do you understand that in one year as a director of a call center in Bangalore, he's a, just a team supervisor, I make more money than my father, my grandfather, and my great-grandfather combined in their lifetimes, okay? Okay, you're, you're grinning, but that's a shock to people that are outside of India. And he goes, so my culture, even though I'm Indian, I'm disconnected from the culture of my, my ancestors. But I don't want to be American. Okay, that's the last thing. You guys are goofy over there. And so I'm in a global diaspora. I'm in between the culture of my parents and, I, and we have a youth culture, but we don't know where we're going. And so a lot of my friends that are Hindu, they look at the, their past culture and they would say, Hinduism is a bunch of cartoons and weirdness. I don't want to be a Hindu, but yet I don't necessarily want to be a Christian. I don't know what I want to be because of the nature of how much money I'm making and my connection to a the global culture. I'm disconnected from my past. I don't know where I'm going. I'm in a global youth diaspora. And a lot of times I connect better with other youth in India and a youth in Ghana and other people that are in the same place. So you are preparing people through youth ministry for when they go into these kind of jobs to be ready to help lead this global youth diaspora that's huge in India, but it's even in other places to a place of finding Christ. Let me stop at this point. Ashish, you've got a lot of stuff, okay, in your thing. Um, can y'all see how strategic, and, and Mario does too, Mario does too. We're trying to pull it out so that a new potential donor goes, whoa, whoa, you know, that's such a different way of doing it. You're building it up from the neighborhood. Whoa, 800 million youth. Whoa. And in this global youth diaspora, people are leaving Hinduism. People are saying that within 50 years, Hinduism will not be one of the top five religions because of this. Okay. And, and part of it is Hinduism survives without globalism destroys Hinduism. Okay. And uh, Ashish, I know you could speak on that. And that may be an overstatement, of course. Uh, but globalism, it doesn't make sense in the global world that you would have the, the, um, the Dalits and the whole caste system. So let me stop at this point. Ashish, what are you thinking as you're hearing this? Uh, yeah, I think uh, I already worked on my paper. But uh, today I got new insights like... Uh, um, you know, uh, about the numbers. And I know Westerners like numbers. <laughs> and especially Indians like to show the numbers. <laughs> so maybe um, it's a good thing. 
and uh, what i understood uh, we are, uh, with uh, this discussion is uh, from this discussion is that uh, we have to curate the interest of the donor um, and uh, and if they see kind of a value and uniqueness specifically uniqueness because uh, as i say that there is no institution or uh, no training available for the youngest nation um, so that uh, that curates the interest and also that helps the donor to understand the need and maybe they would pump in the funds for such projects uh, but i liked uh, today uh, because uh, we are not much focusing on us because uh, most of the time uh, we spend our uh, energy on explaining ourselves or proving our ministries but uh, it is all about uh, this but uh, dr brad i have a question like uh, uh, okay now need and everything is in place but when i place it before the donor or a foundation to get the grant uh, what do they really see do they really see the need or the credibility of the person also who is sending it because most of the time i have seen that um, the credibility played major role uh, who is getting or who is bringing the uh, proposal so uh, what uh, what plays uh, majorly in this uh, scenario so part of it is we're trying to say how do we engage the donor so they start asking the credibility question okay so, and, and all that's why we're going through the, the three questions are a way to engage the donor. Then they will ask the credibility question. It used to be, um, this would have been a decade and a half ago, that Western donors would say, India confuses us. And so we don't understand it, but we trust one man, Richard Howe, and Richard Howe will be the person you trust. How did Richard Howe get a trust? he used this exact process. You would be amazed if you look at what he would do back a year, a decade and a half ago. He would said, he would come in and say, all these people are, India is confusing. He would say, let me express to you what's the need that India has. Let me give you my vision and let me tell you very specific outcomes. What happened is he built trust because he was uniquely able to synthesize what was going on in India so that a potential donor could go, now I'm understanding. This man has made sense of me, sense of India, because it's all confusing. India is confusing, uh, especially to Western donors. And frankly, most Indians are confused by India. Um, and so um, he was able to with, build confidence and trust by his ability. He's a great synthesizer, as you know. He could synthesize things. And you know, one would argue it's reductionistic, sure but it, it created a way for a potential donor to say through his eyes, I, he's pulled his face, my face next to him and he's shown me what he has seen. It engaged my heart It engaged my head. I, he gives me understanding. So what happened is when Richard was doing that, because he understood these three questions, okay? And actually Rob Martin, remember, started the India Collaborative, okay? These questions come from Rob. Rob actually helped Richard get this, right? And so everybody else was talking about, well, this is what I'm doing and this is all this stuff. One person comes through with that degree of clarity, all of a sudden now they're telling each other, well, I don't understand all these other people, but Richard makes sense. I, you can trust Richard that he would get the money to the right place. It really was, and I, I can go back and show you, that's Rob. Rob can talk about his interchanges with Richard two decades ago and helping him get this. Of course, Richard has natural gifts in articulating and synthesizing, um, but that's exactly what he did. Does that make sense? Yeah. So just for people to understand India, and when I explain India to the United States, I say that India is the largest democracy in the world and is the largest English speaking country in the world. True, okay? Unlike the United States that has these 50 states, India has 30 independent nations and cultures that were thousands of years with their own languages and they decided to be one country. Um, it's a, where the United States doesn't have that. And so it's a unique nation that decided that basically 30 
cultures and languages come together and operate as one nation. So it is a very diverse and confusing country. So that, that would you, how would you say that different Ashish? Yeah, that's true. Um, because uh, if I have to explain, yeah, uh, I live in a city called Bombay and uh, in Bombay itself, we have three or four different zones. Uh, geographically, it is uh, six different zones. So if you just uh, cross 10 miles or 15 miles, the culture changes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and even the understanding of people changes, language changes. So it is very, very diverse. Sometimes uh, we are very confused because um, the, we, uh, I did my studies in missions. So what we studied, like uh, one um, solution for all the issues. But here, a um, lot of issues are there and uh, that solution can be applicable only in one situation. Um, it is challenging because um, when I was preparing the proposal, one of the questions came from one of our patrons, Dr. Atula Gamkar. He was saying, are you preparing this uh, from the urban perspective or from the rural perspective? There is a big divide between these two. Uh, um, and if I say urban, then in urban, we have three categories. Uh, tier one city like Bombay, Delhi, Bangalore, then we have tier two cities like Pune and uh, other places uh, like Agra, so to say, and three, tier three cities uh, smaller than one and two tier. So, yeah. And so again, so uh, question is a very good question. And so in your, what you would probably do is focus. And I you know my bias is urban, of course, and Mario is going to be there because the Urban Training Collaborative, that's what they do. Um, and one would argue that if you focus on tier one urban, theoretically, you're influencing more of tier two and tier three, because there seems to be, from my understanding, the way the economics, because economics and political influence moves from tier one to tier two to tier three. What India doesn't have that some other nations have is mass urbanization. And urban is, uh, um, is where you are in an urban context. Urbanization is where the urban changes the culture. So for example, there's a lot of uh, countries in Africa where there is a lot of rural, but because of the way the culture, their access to social media, through telephones, there's an urban culture that is larger than actually the urban, um, the actual urban density of living. And so that's why you have this mass migration and it's happening in, in Africa, it's happening in India, mm -hmm. from people from rural regions to urban, not only because of culture, but mostly because economic uh, opportunity. So what happens is now I'm a young person in the rural environment, somehow I get access to hearing about you know things I get in my mind, uh, and my parents are against this, for me in my opportunity is if I can move to a tier three. And then once I'm there, I maybe have some opportunities that I want to move tier one, then tier two, and then tier one. So in youth ministry, if you work with tier one as your primary focus, you would probably be able to start influencing tier two, tier three, and then rural. But that's not your focus. So let me back up. But is that, that's what I've heard that may be wrong. What do you think about that as an answer to Atul's question? Um, I think he, he, he made a point. And uh, what you also said, um, because the urban city really uh, influences the tier two and tier three cities yeah. because of uh, their economy and uh, most of the globalization effects are seen in the urban settings, uh, tier one cities, and slowly it flows down. Um, and personally, I have seen that those train fl trains flows down uh, in the range of five years. So what we see in Bombay, uh, 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 within five years, you'll be seeing it in rural areas also. So I think I will consider that point and focus much because um, I, I understand his inclinations also. Um, <laughs> I'll have the same uh, bias and, and probably Mario will have the same bias because we're urban. OK, and so and we've been trained by some of the same people. So we'll probably have that same bias. It's urban. <laughs> But uh, Dr. Brad, um, I'm, um, I don't want to make it very urban also, because um, 
most of the Indian uh, society lives in tier two and tier three cities. So uh, I'll have to make it make sure that uh, it is balanced. So where do you start? And this gets into your strategy and your budget later. Because remember, we have five. We have five questions. What is God showing me? What is God telling me to do it? But what would be the outcome? What is my strategy to do that, including my budget? Okay. And then you get into track record and some other things. We'll get into that a little bit more. So later in your strategy, you might say we're leveraging tier one, not giving up on tier two and tier three, but we start with tier one and eventually we'll leverage that to address tier, tier two and tier three cities. And then from there to influence rural environments. If you, but a tool is correct. If you try to start, it's um, India is 1.4 billion. You have to, you, know, you, can't, you can't eat the dinosaur all at once. You got to start eating on a toenail or something first. So one bite at a time. Yeah. So here's what we're going to, I want to talk to Bright and we're going to kind of interview out of Bright. Yeah. I'm actually now not traveling. And so if any of you want to just have a conversation and literally we get on Zoom one-on-one, -on -one, Get out mm -hmm. your working paper and we'll just kind of play with it and talk about it and get it ready for kind of a group conversation. Let mm -hmm. me know. I really do have uh, opportunity to just tell me what's the time that's convenient for you. And it will be 2 a.m. in the morning, but we'll work on it. Um, and we can just kind of work through some of this individually and then we'll have working papers to look at. We'll help each other with our working papers. Because mm -hmm. in working, the next step after that is discovery. Because if you notice in the donor orbit, we talk about looking at who are potential donors locally as well as globally. And then we're gonna spend a lot of time on um, tracking potential donors, how to create systems to be able to say, who are they? If we had a contact with them, what were they interested in? And just really tracking that. But mm -hmm. the working paper we have found, once it's kind of clear, is a great way in, do, in the discovery process of looking for new donors or helping existing donors see us in a new light. Here's the reason why. Um, so we're now working in a group in the Caribbean, which is, um, this is the Caribbean Evangelical Alliance. They have identified uh, wealthy people, okay, that they don't know that well, acquaintances, okay? And they're calling them and saying, um, I, we have been working very hard on fundraising for the 11 Evangelical Alliances of the Caribbean. And we have some, some ways of, of expressing it. We would love to get money from you, but this is not necessarily a fundraising call. Could you, as a potential donor, come help us to evaluate what we call our working paper that expresses what we do? And what is interesting is in saying, yes, obviously at some point we'd love to ask you for money and that would be great. But right now we're asking you, are we effective in building trust with the way we communicate our need and our opportunity. And for a potential donor, you've disarmed them a little bit. You've been honest, at some point I love money, but you've also put them in the same place as on the same side of the table. And what's interesting, a lot of times the donors, uh, this is a very interesting, it depends on the culture. In Asia, they do this actually more, in the United States even more. The potential donor on that place will say, well, this doesn't make sense to me. What if you did this, this, and this? Now, notice what's happening, man. You're taking notes, right? Uh, mm -hmm. We just did this in Asia, and the guy just said, well, I don't like this project. I don't think it would do this. You should do this, this, and this, and this. This doesn't make sense. And, ah, blah, blah. This is a guy in Singapore. He's a banker in Singapore. At the end, it was dis disheartening to uh, the guy that did it. And I go, well, let's talk about it. You learned about what his passion was, what he's excited about. You got some anger for people that... For, that had approached him with a lot, lack of clarity. He said, this is the most clear statement I've ever seen ever. Most people are not clear and he got all angry, okay? Um, donors get hit a lot. And he said, but this, and at the end we go, you're not gonna do the project he asked you to do, okay? That's just not your, that's not your deal. Um, however, you learned a whole lot about him and let's go back and shape this project, closely, but not his project, your project with the com complaints and, com and he that he had. And of course, there's gonna be money to be, be gained from that. Um, and a connection and a building of relationship. And part of it is this donor will see that it was a response. And then we're training a younger person to say, I can't do the project you want, okay? That's not what God has called me to do. But listening to what you shared, hearing, here's the changes I've made in my document. And I think for a donor like that, they said, you listen to me. 
Uh, that was good. And I understand you're not going to do my project. Uh, you've got your own project. But I like the way you changed the document. Um, and I think he's going to get money. I'm almost sure of it. But you may write. So what happens is once you have this working paper, it positions you in a different place than other donors, uh, other uh, people that are seeking donors. You're building trust because you're clear and it's just well stated. And so one of the next exercises and it may not happen exactly during the class, we'll look at discovery people, but we'll ask you to come to a potential acquaintance who's a, who's a potential donor and express to them, what do you think about the way I put this together? And so and it's a really interesting exercise and they improve it and help it and I can go into what happens. So Brian, I'm gonna ask you, what's your purpose and what's your my primary means? Yeah, so um, before coming to the program, the thing that came to me from my part of the world was like, um, a higher education with a certain quality education is making our people do the ordinary things that support life. For example, reducing poverty, uh, getting to know Christ by reading their books and when they are even in groups, they're able to argue out what they believe in. And then uh, having that ownership and then collaborative effort between the various cultures that come around. So that was my purpose of saying that if it is this way, I think that we need to be able to give education to our people, certain quality of education that can help our people. That was the purpose. So uh, <clears throat> we tried to be able to set up a, a, a mission that would be able to drive this purpose. Because what we were seeing was in our part of the world, most of these donors were coming into our country, but they come with like what we said, the presence era, which is still happening. They bring their own donations. They come from the West. The country director is, a, is from the West. The finance director is from the West. The project director is all from the West. All these people come in to come and do what we are facing in our country because we don't have capacity. That was the purpose of which we set up a training center which goes beyond the just skills by giving um, uh, degree-based qualifications that could help our people, our young people to take the positions of these country directors so that they can own these issues themselves and then continue to do it. That is all we have been doing. So if you had to state in a short sentence, what's the purpose? of your work at the school, what is it? The purpose is to give quality, the quality higher education to the youth. Okay. And you will achieve that by, what are the primary means? By, by setting up a university college. Okay, um, okay. What is the, now, what is the need? What's unique about the need and the opportunity that you're facing there? Uh, the, the opportunity is, um, <clears throat> having a bilingual uh, kind of education for people in the West Coast uh, is able to attract people from other areas to be able to work with them because language is one of the problems that we have. And our area is also rich in everything that we can help in alleviating poverty. So people are, are attracted to the West Coast of Africa because of the kind of things we have like, we have all the resources that are there like gold, we are the highest producers of gold, Ghana is the highest producer of gold, Cote d'Ivoire is the second. In Coco, Cote d'Ivoire is first, Ghana is second. So we have everything that the West also need in anything that they use to feed the world. So God's resources are with us. But when it comes to a place like Cote d'Ivoire, language barrier is one of the things that they face. So when you give education to people in English and French, they are able to interact with any other donor or any other person working in the in the so the, the so the opportunity is you have economic build there you've got the people coming in um but the primary challenge is the english french yes um, the the primary challenge at that particular area is the english and french that is for ghana french and in uh, in Cote d'Ivoire english but most of the time the where the, the challenge is, is in Cote d'Ivoire or the French-speaking areas. 
And so we rather bring the English education to top up with their French education to give them that bilingual status that they can work through all these uh, uh, donor uh, channels. Okay, so let's say I'm a, I'm a potential donor and, mm -hmm. and you, state, you state your purpose, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you say the um, Africa is a rising continent. Okay. Yes. Economically, politically, uh, countries are finding their their stance. They're finding stability. Although you know you're always hearing it in the news, but more and more and more, we're finding uh, this continent is rising. Amazing resources. The primary uh, business language of the world is English. The yes. primary language of where this economic is building is English. Yes. This rule is in Cote d'Ivoire, which is French. And mm -hmm. so if we're going to help this nation to engage the business of the world and the rising economic opportunities of Africa, young leaders are going to have to have their higher, higher education in English language, but also understanding the concepts, the, the business concepts in yes. English. So we are uniquely positioned to train younger leaders in Cote d'Ivoire to um, connect with the rising economic opportunity of Africa and the world by training them in English. Yes. Okay. So um, otherwise, uh, French nations will be left behind. Yes. And that's what we're trying to avoid. Yeah, because we have seen, we have also seen that, especially in our part of the world, why we are looking at that is, the various English colonized countries are a better place in terms of development, in terms of getting the skill sets to be able to attract this development coming into them than the French ones. So the way to solve that problem is to be able to bring the English to the French area so that we can be on equal footing if we have to compete or if we have to be a United Africa, that is very important. And also what we have seen is that once we have that level of English education, it also reduces uh, the political influences that we have uh, around these areas. Okay, and so that's worth expressing a little bit. So that's what God is showing you. Yes. Um, what and God is telling you to do about it is to create an English school that, that opens up these opportunities. Yes. If, you, if it happened, okay, outcomes, what would mm -hmm. be different? Say that again. If you if you were successful at building mm -hmm. a school and engaging and training uh, uh, these young people in higher education to engage mm -hmm. the opportunities, the economic and political opportunities that open up with English, what would be different? What would be the outcomes? Yes, the outcomes are very enormous. First of all, uh, like I said, they are able to go and then have. Um, economic engagements, and then uh, they will not be stuck in one area where they will not have access to the international and global markets. So those um, economic issues or economic aids will be trickling into our countries, and that will help us well to alleviate poverty. And also, uh, in terms of Christ-like behavior, most of these crusades are conducted in English all around the world and we will have the opportunity to engage as we are able to speak the language correctly and have the skill set in pastoring and uh, evangelism as well. So let me stop at this point. And um, anybody else, when you heard him, we kind of interviewed that out of him, was that, notice he didn't talk a lot about his school, okay? We're not there yet, right? How did that help you? Did that help you to understand what Bright is working on and why that's so important? But you notice he did not talk about the specific part of his school. Let me just, I don't know who is all engaging or not. Maurice, if you're hearing this, was that helpful for you to understand his vision and what the opportunity is? So Maurice, what did, what did you hear when you heard Bright express that? We didn't even explain his school at that point. So Maurice, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, what I saw, he explained that there is a gap a gap uh, between the opportunity uh, that could be available and uh, the potential 
uh, for that opportunity and that the hindrance is, uh, is language. Uh, that was one of the things that came out. And therefore, I would think that uh, he, he would be successful when he then, after that, mentions that therefore he needs to establish a school uh, that would help bridge that gap of language and the opportunity and the fact that uh, 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 English is the primary language um, of the world and, and therefore it opens the opportunities for the people who do not have the opportunity in the, in the Francophone countries. When he explained that, did that help you now, now he's gonna talk about his school, did that help you kind of know, okay, now I understand why there's a school. If he talked about his school without going into that, it would be hard to understand, okay, an English school in Cote d'Ivoire, what does that mean? You know, do you understand how the logic of him, because he just spent a whole lot of time talking about need, vision, and outcomes, and didn't even talk about a school. And yet you probably understand a whole lot more about the school because he did that. That, that was kind of my point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Of course, there would be need then for him to um, mention the school at the end so that uh, whoever <clears throat> donor is listening can put it all together uh, and can have what you mentioned earlier about clarity of, um, of the mission. So the working paper, and I'm gonna, we're going to end today, but I'm gonna, we're going to talk about kind of steps in between this and next Thursday. What is God showing me? What is God telling me to do about it? What would happen if I did it? That's what we just did. Now, the fourth thing is strategy and budgets, okay? Um, so now the donor is ready to hear about the school in detail and, and, and potential fundraising needs that they'd have. That's really the whole point of the working paper is to get our logic together to build trust with clarity so that we engage the donor in what we see that God has shown us before we get to our solution. And that's really the whole point. So what, what I will do is, um, is you look at kind of your week, um, uh, here is my email address, and this is probably gonna be, um, let's see, here we go. Uh, so what, what you could do is if you can send me a uh, time, um, and we can just spend an, an hour on Zoom. Um, send me a time that works for you and I'll, I'll make come back and say, well, that won't work, but what about this or what about this? What will you do mm -hmm. is just one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and if you could write your working paper as far as you can. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then what will you do is just kind of work on it. So next week, we'll look at each other's working papers and we'll learn from each other by having our working papers in place. And what we'll probably do is, is send... Um, them to each other uh, prior to it. So everybody has it on their desk. And then uh, we'll kind of look through each other's working papers. But I would, if possible, uh, if you want, if you could set up an individual time with me um, and we'll just look at the paper and play with it and kind of get it ready and then have it ready to send to each other to, to kind of talk about that whole thing um, next, next uh, Thursday at the same time. Okay. And we'll get past the working papers, but the working <clears throat> papers opens up doors uh, for discovery of it's a great strategy for the, because the next thing we're going to get into is thinking through who potentially will approach. And Ashish, I know you're approaching this partly to, to raise money for BGU, um, but we are approaching it through the window of this fantastic vision and project you have. And then, so you're saying, this is where I'm going. However, I need some money to have the uh, training. My BGU project would actually be to flesh this thing out. Um, so now the donor is saying, it's not just about Ashish, it's about Ashish as an appointed person that needs this. And we'll explain, we'll get into why education would help you accomplish this vision. So even though it feels like we're one step off and Ashish has had personal support uh, training that's been excellent. This would add to that so that a potential donor says, in giving to this project, it makes sense that I would also give to his education because that education is focused on this project, if that makes sense. So I know someone yeah. is talking about, even though you, you're wanting to raise money for school, we're talking about how do we create an ongoing effectiveness in raising money for God's calling in your life? School's mm -hmm. a part of that. So. 
So we'll meet sure. again same time next next week. Um, Mario, when will you be back uh, home or have a little more? Will that be? Or are you going to be in in uh, Guatemala the whole the whole week? I will be back on Sunday. Okay. So back to work from Monday on. So we may because you're big, you're gonna be busy there. So just you know, send me a thought of what might be a good time to meet on Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, and we'll we'll do that. Yeah, um, yeah. Dr. Red. Dr. Yeah. Red. So what what do we get there? I'm not able to assess the the um, the, uh, the recorded the videos. Where is it that we get it? Let me let me work on that. I've I've been traveling. Okay, it's not I, sent, I Okay, to, I need to change. In popular, it's mm. not good, and so. Okay. Yeah. So I apologize. Yeah. I've been not able to get to Populi, so I will clean all <laughs> that up, and I'll have those links available to you. I just okay. need to spend some time in Populi and get it cleaned up. Give me about. Um, I'll have that done by Saturday, and then. No. Uh, take it up so. so the the email, the one that you send the the, the invite through, can we use that email to contact you? Yes, that would be the okay. best if you don't mind. Right. That way, that's easier, and and we can just set up a time and go with that. Yeah. All right, so I really need to say that down so that we can have some discussions on that yeah, coaching. Yeah, I need your coaching. white paper as far as you have it, and then we'll just kind of play with it and work on it. And, mm -hmm. and again, it's um, and we'll go from there. The working paper. No problem. Thank you. Any other questions or thoughts at this point? And and we'll move from working papers into discoveries right after this. But I want to make sure the work the working paper is a tool for that. And discovery is looking at potential donors and contacting them, <laughs> tracking that, and all the all the fun work, which is fun. One other thought, just before we leave, it really does help to do this as a team. It really does. If you have um, a prayer partner, somebody that's good at writing, this could be a volunteer, um, somebody that could just kind of be alongside you and just encourage you. It's uh, fundraising is hard to do individually. But if you can have a team and engage people, you could be even you know, sharing some of the things you're doing here. Uh, it really does give you encouragement, accountability. A lot of what this, this course will do is it gives you kind of a weekly thing you do. But even after this course is over, having a team really helps this to be much more enjoyable. Praying, helping you write, helping to think about potential people to go see. If you have a board member that it would come, go see it with you, that, then they're basically validating. So think about if you wanted to build a team that would just help you ongoing, way past this course, who would you have on the team and what would you be asking them to do? And would it be helpful to go ahead and ask them to be part of some of these Zoom meetings and to kind of engage and to, to be journeying along with you um, to be able to have the same vision that, that you have? So, but I just find it's very hard to do this <laughs> It's a lonely, it can be a lonely job. So. Any other questions or thoughts before we leave? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that uh, last week I couldn't, there was an oversight on my part about the time the class is taking place, but I am one of those who really needed this class and um, uh, God willing, who want to stick with it to the end. And I, I, I can hear that you talked about the working paper and from the thoughts, the, 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 what has been discussed, that will be very important for me. I hope I'll find the link to what happened in last class so that by the next class, I'm uh, up to date with everyone. I'll get those links out and I apologize. I've been, I've been traveling and so even I was late last week. So that was very confusing for everybody. So most of that, that that's my fault, Maurice. And so thank you for, we'll get, we'll get, I'm now here. Um, one of the things that we can look at is, Maurice, if you could send me a time um, that is a, you, you would like just to meet one-on-one, -on -one, we can go yeah. through all of that without you having to watch all these videos. And But if you could, go ahead and start um, on the working paper. Um, let me, you know what, I'll, I'll send out the working paper instructions uh, to everybody. They're in the property, but that way you'll have a fresh version of them. And yeah. Uh, and just start working on that and then they'll set up an individual time and we'll just kind of talk it through um, and can help you catch up that way. That'd probably be the best way to do it. Yes. And give me, give it, send me a, an email time that works for you. I may adjust a little bit mm -hmm. and then uh, let's just meet one-on-one. -on -one. So we come back next week. Um, everybody will have their working paper, you know, pretty far along 
and we can look at each other and gain ideas from each other and, and go with that. That's great. Mario, tell Joel hello and the, the team. So uh, you got a good group. Yes, I will. So, uh, Thank you. Maurice, would you mind closing us in prayer today? Sure. Precious Father, we thank you for this moment that we've had, this productive, enlightening moment. We have got insights of how to be effective and to do your work better and how to engage and impact our communities and to make a difference in the world and to fulfill our call. We pray, Lord, for each and every one of us that you will give us the opportunity, the time, you, you, we will have the, 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 the persistence, the follow-up, so that we do not drop out. We thank you, Lord, and we thank you for Dr. Brad and for all the students, all that have uh, checked in, all that are committed to this. We pray for each one of them, Lord. May you enable them even to continue to enable us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you. We look forward to seeing you between now and next Thursday and also next Thursday at the same time. So, thank you. Good. All right. Thank you.